Good evening or good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to, uh, to get us started, and I'd like to welcome you to the, uh, the panel discussion on Ebola and ethics. My name is Thorne Tritter, and I'm the Managing Director of the Fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics. And the panel discussion is organized by FASB, as we call it. Um, I know many in the audience are familiar with FASB, but some of you may be wondering what that FASB name is. So before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to just say a word or two about FASB. FASB was launched in 2009, and it is a set of programs for students in professional schools designed to address contemporary ethical issues through the unique historical context of the Holocaust. More specifically, FASB provides business, journalism, law, medical, and seminary students with a 12-day trip to Germany and Poland where the actions of professionals during the Holocaust and in Nazi Germany serve as a backdrop and launching point for an intensive course of study about contemporary ethics in these professions. Our work uses the power of place, the first-hand experience of visiting Auschwitz, and other historic sites to engage fellows in applying the lessons of history to the ethical issues they face today. As our fellows know, and some of them are in the audience, FASB, the trip for FASB is really the beginning of a much longer relationship. And we work hard to keep our alumni uh, involved in discussions throughout the year about the ethical issues that are coming up in their, wor in their work. And each January, we bring our fellows and encourage our fellows to gather here in New York at a time when everybody wants to be in New York in January, uh, to come back from all our disciplines from all past years to meet for our reunion and symposium. And a central part of that event over the past several years has been a public program here at the museum about some contemporary event or some ethics issue that our fellows and others are facing. In the past few months, there have been a number of events in the news that have sparked conversations among our fellows. Uh, but one notable event seemed to connect all the different disciplines that we work in, the outbreak of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, and thus our panel for this afternoon. And we are honored to have four panelists uh, who are experts in their respective field. I don't want to take too much longer in my introductions, but let me say a few words about each of them. I apologize in advance for not doing justice to their credentials, but I do want to get to the discussion. So uh, to my far right is Brooke Gladstone, a journalist who is perhaps best known as the host of NPR's On the Media. Among her other accomplishments, she was an NPR Moscow-based reporter, its first media reporter, a senior editor for NPR's All Things Considered, and the senior editor of Weekend Edition with Scott Simon. She is the author of The Influence Machine, a book that came out in 2011 by W.W. W. Norton, uh, which was listed as one of the, the top books by New Yorker and Publishers Weekly for that year. Earlier this fall, Brooke traveled to Liberia, and some of you who may be fans of her show have listened to her, some of her reports about it, but she looked particularly, uh, did stories particularly about how the media was affected in Liberia and was covering the Ebola outbreak. Next to Brooke is Dr. Joseph Finns, the E. William, the e. William Davis Jr. MD Professor of Medical Ethics and Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics at Weill Cornell Medical College, where he also serves as a professor of medicine, a professor of public health, and a professor of medicine and psychiatry. He's the director of the medical ethics at New York, a director of medical ethics at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center. The author of uh, 250 publications. His newest book, newest book, which will be coming out this summer, is entitled Rights Come to Mind, Brain Injury Ethics and the Struggle for Consciousness, published by Cambridge University Press. As I understand it, the book focuses on one family's struggle with severe brain injury, exploring how the developments in neuroscience call for a reconsideration of what society owe patients at the edge of consciousness. As a leading bioethicist, he's also recently been thinking about the clinical issues involved in the treatment of patients with Ebola. Our third panelist is Lawrence Gostin, university professor at Georgetown University and director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. He served as associate dean for research at Georgetown Law from 2004 to 2008. In addition to his work for Georgetown Law School, he's also a professor of medicine at Georgetown University, 
Professor of Public Health at the Johns Hopkins University and Director of the Center for Law and the Public Health at Johns Hopkins University and Georgetown University. Professor Gostin is the Director of the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center on Public Health Law and Human Rights and also serves on the WHO's Director General's Advisory Committee on Reforming the World Health Organization. His most recent scholarship, which includes two articles that have been published in The Lancet in the past year, focus on Ebola and ethics. Our fourth panelist is Reverend Jack Amick, who serves as the United Methodist Committees on Relief, UMCOR's Assistant General Secretary for International Disaster Response. In this position, Reverend Amick works to strengthen relationships with the United Methodist Central Conferences and Bishops, as well as with Global Relief and Development Partners. He manages the United Methodist Committee on Relief's actions in the wake of natural or human-caused disasters in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, coordinating with the leadership in affected areas. Prior to being ordained a United Methodist elder, Reverend Amick served as Vice Counsel for Economic Affairs at the Mumbai Consulate in India, and before coming to UMCOR, he worked on disaster response for the Peace Corps and for Red Cross. And finally, our moderator, immediately to my right, is David Goldman a partner in the law firm of McDermott, Will & Emery, here in New York, the head of the firm's International Corporate Advisory Practice Group. In addition to his professional work, he is the founder of FASB and the chairman of the FASB Steering Committee. So welcome to you all, welcome to you, and David, let me pass the uh, baton to you to lead our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Thorin. I had asked uh, Thorne, in the interest of time, not to uh, review all of my publications. <laughs> so, thank you. There's a long list uh, somewhere. Uh, I thought it would be good just to, as I said, as we talked, to set the table a bit and to ask each of you to speak for a couple of minutes about what you think um, we should be talking about today, what interests you as relates to ethical issues in your professions. Brooke, do you want to begin? Sure. For us, obviously, for anybody in the media, uh, when you tell a story, obviously you want people to listen to it, or to read it, or to see it. And so there's a problem of framing, basically just a problem of how do you tell it in a relatable way. And uh, we had observed during the Ebola coverage that there was virtually no coverage until somebody showed up in Texas infected. And then uh, Liberia, which became a uh, place of great interest to me, was basically depicted as a squiggle on a map with the word Ebola written on it in red. Uh, even the stories that came from there, stories full of pathos, didn't give you a sense of the people at all. It just gave you a sense of the victims and the disease. And, uh, and I think that that tends to flatten the perception and diminish any lasting interest in the story. We have this problem with news emanating from Africa in general, which has been said in the last week about the disparity in the coverage between the uh, attacks of, uh, by Boko Haram in uh, Baga and neighboring villages compared to the attacks in Paris on Charlie Hebdo and other sites in the city. So it's, uh, you know, we have a problem, it's probably a racial problem, no question about it. The next, but race, not necessarily born of racism as we think of it, that, you know, we're not interested. It, it, it's not that we hate those people, it's that we don't care about those people because we don't identify with those people, and that has to do with race or with location, with their circumstances. And so the thing is, is that you have to, what I've been focusing on, and maybe we'll talk a little about, a bit about in this discussion, is where we go wrong in the media in depicting tragic diseases like this and how we can do it better. Thanks, Brooke. Joe? Well, it kind of ties with what Brooke's saying. And I, and I, I guess what everything I'm going to tell you about tonight uh, is a footnote to that larger question of what's going on where the epidemic, the pandemic, really is causing uh, death at, 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 at a terrifying degree, although there seems to be some element of containment now. And uh, when Mr. Duncan died in, 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 in Texas, and I like to refer to people by their names because they're people and they all have 
you know, human worth. Um, and he was a real person, he was related to a family, and he wasn't an anonymous person. Um, it struck me uh, that we hadn't, in the developed world, really come to grips with the clinical ethical problems that would happen when somebody uh, came to a tertiary care center with Ebola. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sidebar to the neglect of Ebola in general in, by the Western world in, in Africa. Um, that we hadn't really thought about these issues. So I, I was very concerned about what would happen if a patient showed up at, 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 a, at a hospital in New York City or in Texas or in Virginia or somewhere uh, with Ebola and the question came up about whether we should resuscitate them. So I wrote a piece um, in the Hastings Center Bioethics Forum in part because of the delay that would be engendered if I had sent it to a medical journal and, would, and I thought it was, uh, as, as you're, you're interested in professionalism, I thought I had a professional obligation to weigh in on that debate and offer an opinion uh, on whether or not patients who had end-stage Ebola should undergo cardiopulmonary resuscitation, uh, given the one, the, I thought, and most people did think, the futility of the interventions is there's no treatment on the other side of the resuscitation, and two, of the risk of contagion. As I wrote that piece, um, uh, people in, at Emory and in Madrid who were healthcare workers were actually uh, coming down with Ebola because of their personal protective uh, equipment uh, was, was still incomplete. The, the, the standards for uh, covering one's shoes uh, had yet to be implemented um, as, as a standard of uh, protective gear. So I wrote this piece and, and, I, and, and I'll, I can go into the details later if it's relevant or not but why I, I went through that analysis but I think the key point is is that when you are confronted by a moral or a crisis, uh, even if you're offering a point of view that may be unpopular or complicated, you have an obligation to voice that opinion as a professional. Um, and it's kind of like initiating a, a Hegelian dialectic. You know, that, that by starting the conversation, you hope somebody will respond and, and that will engender discussion. And too often we, we, we seek refuge as physicians and, and scientists in a kind of a technical explication of things and we don't get into the value questions which really were what do we owe individuals versus what kind of risk do we put professionals into versus versus the needs of the community and the spread of contagion so I've gotten very interested since then in the boundary line between professionalism and heroism certainly there are lots of professionals who are heroes uh, doctors without borders those people who go into the epidemic those folks I think are heroic but if we expect professionals in toto to be heroic, uh, we might have a manpower issue because her heroism, we go back to the Greeks, they're, they're singular individuals. It's not normative to be heroic, but professionalism in the professional class should be normative. So we run the risk of setting the standard so high that it won't be fulfilled and we'll have a kind of, you know, a sort of gross abdication of, of minimal levels of responsibility. Larry? Um, well, thank you. Two beautifully stated um, uh, positions. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming in this horrible weather and uh, to thank Thorin and my son Bryn and daughter Jennifer Gostin are here, so uh, that's very, very special to me. We're not um, giving you the Oscar today. <laughs> Why? Wrong place. I <laughs> thought, oh, no, it is. That, that, was, that was in the email. <laughs> no, um, no, uh, is there music that, that we play? <laughs> ethics is, I'm not an ethicist, first of all, but I, w but I play one on television. That's why I wanted to get the Oscar. Um, but I, I, was I, on, I was on the President's Bioethics Commission in uh, healthcare reform under President Clinton, and I was on the ethics cluster. And we used to go around the uh, Oval Office, not the Oval Office, you know, that, would, would, that would be in bad form, but the old executive office building, and just shake no to our colleagues as if the ethicists knew what was right and wrong, but we really don't. It's very, very rare that we know what's right and wrong, but if there were a clear rule for me about Ebola and ethics, it would be something like this, that um, good ethics equals good science and public health. And if we follow that, most of the time we're going to be right. And this is basically what I have in mind, that 
We, we lost perspective in the United States, not just the press that lost perspective. I mean, it's one of the saddest things for me is, is that as soon as the, the last case of Ebola uh, came in the United States, the press went away and was not uh, interested anymore while it was still ravaging. So I think we, have, we certainly have an ethical responsibility to keep ourselves safe, our country safe, our healthcare workers safe. Uh, and I think we're, we're well capable of doing that. I think we always were, and I think that the media and the public uh, and, and the Congress overacted very badly. We had a couple of cases here uh, where there were tens of thousands of deaths in West Africa. Um, but I think that it, it is in our self-interest to contain the epidemic uh, in West Africa, but it's also, I think, a humanitarian perspective. Uh, and it, it, it's an absolutely essential that we think uh, as a compassionate community. And it seemed really troubling to me uh, that it took the international community, the United States, so long um, before uh, it was able to um, uh, respond. Now, uh, I'm not always pro-American, as my son uh, uh, reminds me all the time. He is. Um, but uh, when uh, I, w I was on the PBS NewsHour, just when uh, President Obama was sending our troops uh, into Liberia, but not Sierra Leone or Guinea, uh, uh, because there was a post-colonial um, way that we engaged in West Africa, um, and they said, well, what do you think of that? And I just thought, I'm very proud of the United States for doing that. Uh, and Right now, what I'm working on is why the World Health Organization didn't do it and what the kind of global governance for health would be there. So in short, good science, self-interest, and a humanitarian perspective would mean that we would focus intense resources uh, in uh, the three most affected countries in West Africa and bring this under control uh, rapidly. And then there are things I would like to talk about during our uh, discussion about what we could do to prevent the next uh, epidemic. Thanks. From the humanitarian assistance side of things and from the church side of things, I would like to, us to look a little bit at what is behind the response. What's behind our interest in helping people? In the Methodist Church, which is where I come from, we talk about John Wesley's three rules, love God, love your neighbor, and do no harm, which we share with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that, there are a lot of different ways of looking at this, and, and a lot of, no matter what um, code you want to pull up, what ethical standard you want to look at, underneath it is why are we engaging? And I think that's an important question to ask because as was pointed out, there was a bit of a lag, a time, time lag here. And although one part of our organization was indeed working with health boards and has been for, for years in these, in these countries, there was pressure from some of our constituency in the US only later on. But I will say that because of partnerships between the church and historically United Methodist uh, dominant Liberia, but also Sierra Leone, there was contact between churches and churches in churches in the US and churches in in these countries. And there was a sense of partnership uh, between for a long time between these these entities. But I want us to think about what's driving our need, because I think that our need to give, our need to serve, our need to help, because that will, that will affect how we help people and whether we do it without doing harm or not. And, and I think that one of the things that, that I saw was a lot of people wanted to send things, fill up containers and send things, whether they were PPEs or a variety of things or things that didn't have anything to do with, with the disaster. There was an impetus to send things. And I understand that people want to touch things and share things, and that's, that's almost a sacramental type of an instinct. Mm. There's meaning behind stuff, and there's meaning behind actions. And so we need to honor that and give people the opportunity to do that sort of thing. However, 
the international standards of humanitarian assistance and really our own ethical codes as, as, as faith-driven entities is that we want to do the best we can by people, empowering them, upholding their human dignity. And so ultimately, we would prefer to transfer funds to local organizations, be these health boards or, or other, that can then build up the economy by purchasing local where we can find the things, and, and hire people locally, and work with folks on the ground to help themselves. Uh, two comments that I'd like to make, and then turn it over to, to you all. Uh, one, we do want to save some time for question and answers from the audience. Uh, and so please, um, if you have questions, hold them until uh, later. Secondly, one of the goals of FASB is to be talking cross-profession. Uh, and so what we're hoping to do with discussions like this is to engage in a discussion about a current issue, but think about it across the professions. Um, one theme that I heard from all of you was really the responsibility of the profession. Um, Brooke, it seems to me that uh, you're the first, you journalists are the first point of entry to the public. Um, is it, do, do, you, do you think that it is the responsibility of the press to set an agenda? I mean, how do you decide? By simply reporting, they begin the process of setting an agenda. Uh, it's, it is not a goal. The goal is to inform. But when you start making editorial judgments over what you'll cover and how much you'll cover it and what doesn't get covered, an agenda of sorts begins to emerge. Uh, it doesn't always prevail. I mean, it really doesn't. I mean, if you look at, uh, and well, if you look at the, the banks, just, you know, the economy crashing, or if you look at uh, Abu Ghraib, I mean, these are areas where reporters went again and again and again, drawing people's attention to it. I know there was a real effort to keep telling tiny little slices of Abu Ghraib every time a new headline emerged in order to keep it on the front pages, but it's not as if it tremendously affected much of anything, or if it did, the effects were subtle and maybe one round of stories would have accomplished that. I don't know. And the same thing with you know, the bankers that had, have not been tried and have not gone to prison and had their, uh, you know, the fines that are levied that really don't matter and, and that sort of thing. So I always say this is, I always like to say the media are not as powerful as a lot of people would love to think that they are because then you can shift responsibility. They are as much a reflection maybe even more of a reflection than they are a driver of policy. But I'm, I'm not going to deny that the simple act of reporting on something has an impact on it. I think, you know, we shouldn't lay it all on the journalists. I mean, it's really the educational system and basic science and ethical literacy. And, and it's understanding, you know, what, how, do, how does this disease work? You know, what, what, is the, what is the vector? How is it communicated? And, and it's a lack of, it's really infrastructure building, not only in country, in, in, in West Africa, but also here, so that, so that when people hear a report, they know what to make of it. And superstition doesn't blind the eye, as it were, because it could easily do that. So I think it's, you know, we think about healthcare, you know, healthcare is a component of, of a good society, but it's not the only component. And, and really, we're talking here ultimately about the questions of deliberative democracy. And, and an educated populace that is able to, to make choices, ethical choices, <coughs> allocation choices, setting priorities about why what happens over there is important to us, not only to protect our public health, but also to reaffirm our kind of common humanity. Can, I, can I jump it off of something that you just said? Because the, uh, when you talk about the media writ large, I would say at least in the area of hemorrhagic diseases, the entertainment media have done a great deal more to shape our perceptions of disease <laughs> than, uh, than the news media have. Uh, I interviewed a professor who studied the outbreak narrative called, uh, her name's Priscilla uh, Wald at uh, Duke, 
And she was describing, you know, in the movie Outbreak or in the movie The Hot Zone, it's a contagion, there's a new microbe, it creates a new disease, and it's got to be awful, like Ebola, something that liquefies organs and makes blood come out of all your orifices, and it happens in a jungle somewhere, and then because of our interconnected society, it gets into the cities, and it starts to be a species-threatening event, and the solution always comes from the U.S., ultimately. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the outbreak always, ha well, I won't say always, mostly happens in Africa. Sometimes it happens in Asia. And, uh, and one of the features of the outbreak narrative is that it ends. There's, oh, the result is never as horrific and apocalyptic as everybody feared. Uh, now, there are certain diseases that defy this narrative, but Ebola is one that lends itself to this narrative, and that's a huge problem. That's how we think about it, and it's all wrong. Um, Priscilla Wald argues that it needs to start earlier than the outbreak. It needs to start in the place where the outbreak occurs, and they have to examine the, uh, the health systems there and the uh, environmental uh, conditions there and the, uh, the structures that uh, serve the citizens there and that's the beginning of the real outbreak narrative but that's not the story we tell ourselves. Brooke, what you just described is fascinating and I'm sure that the NPR audience listens to it. Um, putting that aside, had uh, the patient not ended up in Texas or New York, what, what do we do? What do we do in the United States? Oh, I feel like I'm dominating the discussion, but I'll be happy to talk about this. I think that uh, what we the have... The Oscar is not up. As long as I don't thank anybody, I can keep going, right? <laughs> uh, you know, what we have to do is to make those stories into narratives and be careful not to fall into classic journalism pitfalls, one of which is a phenomenon that's known in, in my business as compassion fatigue, mm -hmm. where you know what happens is that there's a disaster in an area or an area that is prone to disasters, and you tell them, and then you have to raise the stakes each time in mm -hmm. order to, you believe, to get uh, that sense of engagement and that sense of horror that uh, that might create an environment in which people care. And so, you know, but you can't just keep raising the stakes in an endless horror spiral, which doesn't take you anywhere. Uh, Ethan Zuckerman, who's uh, at MIT, believes that the way you do it is by telling the stories of individuals and weaving the big numbers into it. Mm -hmm. I have a fascinating anecdote that I'll talk to you about later, since I feel my time for now is up, about numbers uh, and, and their problems and their profound effect on the, on the mind. You, you raise a good point. And we experience a similar phenomenon. And that is that when there's a big disaster, well reported by the media, uh, though it's not the media's fault, the, uh, the yes, pushback. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, no, all right, I, all right. You don't have to apologize to me. <laughs> The, the pushback that we get is, is let's do something very specific around this disaster. And generally, lots of resources come in. The flip side of that is that two countries away, there may be a, a Bangladesh or Kashmir or somewhere that <coughs> Philippines that gets pounded with disaster after disaster after disaster year after year. Or Syria that's ongoing. In those, those places, we experience the same sort of thing. Compassion fatigue, donor fatigue is how it's translated for us. And folks aren't as interested in giving for those specific disasters. So we've, done, we've taken responsibility in a couple of ways. One way is that we've tried to shift the culture of our organization and our donors so that they're encouraged to give more generally. That allows us the ability to respond to disasters in a way that's appropriate to that particular disaster and not have resources tied, locked up in a particular place on disaster response. Uh, we also try to respond to the, those disasters that are 
underreported, let's say, less reported, or less heard about. Less, uh, one of the reasons the library was popular be, was because of the historical connection, the connection with United Methodists historically in, in that country. But there are places that we did a, a response a year ago a, to a snowstorm in Peru that wiped out a bunch of alpaca and um, had the population there hungry for, for months. So we, we provide some food through an organization that works down there. That's the kind of thing that doesn't get the big stories. And so we feel that it's our duty, Christian in this case, to not walk on the other side. It's our duty to, to be present with those folks in one way or another. Larry, I know you want to talk about resources. Be before you, I'm guessing, before you do. No. Oh. <laughs> um, Jack, I want to, uh, you've talked about um, philanthropy. Uh, I'd like to come back to the church itself. Um, in terms, of, we, we, we talked about the media's responsibility mm -hmm. to inform. Same thing for the church? I believe so. I, I think that the church, we have a captive audience. In some, in some places, it's, it's smaller than, than it maybe should be, but <laughs> maybe getting smaller in, in some churches, but, but growing in others. And so we in, would encourage clergy and, and leaders in churches to, to bring truth back into the forefront, to, to remind people of some of these, these facts, to point people to the disasters in the world that, are, that get overlooked, to point to, to places where people are suffering so that something can be done about it, so that people can be moved to respond and participate. All right, well, I think we've talked essentially about two things so far. One is the media's role and education's role, and the other is the, the humanitarian disaster part. So I thought I'd just spice it up and disagree a little bit with the panel. Um, so my observations about, and about the media uh, and about the political discourse around Ebola was, to me, it was very troubling. Uh, I think it, it presented a very skewed response. Uh, it, there was, of course, that narrative that you talked about. There's no question about it and the, the horrific part of Ebola uh, played into it, but we, it also brought out the same uh, the, the same misinformation as we had with SARS, uh, with H1N1, with H5N1 influenza, um, where so what you what you ended up having was this idea that somehow we needed to to do everything that we could to prevent any cases from coming to the United States, and so it was about quarantine, it was about um, travel restrictions, it was about travel bans. I spent almost all of my two-week period trying to dispel that those were bad things. Now, I think you had mentioned do no harm. That would have done a great deal of harm, uh, and it did do a great deal of harm to, for a while, because when you, when you quarantine health workers coming back, it dissuades them from, going, go, from right. going in, in the first place. Uh, if we had ever had a, a literal travel ban on West Africa, uh, I don't think that, that Af Africa per se would have forgiven the United States for many, many years, and other countries would have jumped in. So, so the, would it, I'm not pl placing the finger of blame on the media or Congress. Whatever it was, the information that came out was very distorted and harmful, I thought. Extremely so. Um, on the humanitarian disasters, I mean, of course, we all, our hearts always go out when there is a humanitarian disaster. But I, I feel that when there is a you know, big flood, a big earthquake, the media jumps on it, mm -hmm. Americans start throwing money into it. But the everyday suffering, I just came back from Bangladesh and I, I saw the, the slums and the BRAC sites. BRAC is, 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 a, is, a, is the largest development organization in the world, but one that most Americans have never heard of. Um, those kinds of things, just they, they, they don't get reported. The, the fragile health systems pre-Ebola 
in uh, these post-conflict states. Uh, and so we, yes, now very belatedly we're going in, we're trying to get to zero cases of Ebola, but what's gonna happen after that? Will we just gonna have a decimated health system? Do we have a plan? And I think there are some very, very clear things we can, should do that I and others have, 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 have called for. But then it's just gonna leave. We'll get, we'll get on to the next humanitarian disaster. And so I have a, a discomfort with, you know, one, the idea that, that the media and, and, and Congress and other leaders actually inform. I think that they don't, that they, that they mislead. Um, and then sec secondly, uh, uh, the, the focus on a discrete humanitarian disaster that's prominent Very is not yeah. that helpful. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, just, well, and we don't need to agree on everything we should. No, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> I actually agree. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, sticking just for a moment with the educational component, the information component of this, as you look back, what, what should the, sh is there a medical profession response? Is it possible to have a medical profession response? What, what should have been? Well, you know, I, I agree with what Larry just said. I, I think the responses can't be, you know, episodic. It's like using an emergency room instead of having a primary care doctor. I mean, you know, you, and deal, with public the, health you deal with the emergency, you don't deal with the, the, you know, the health prevention and all the, all the, all the stuff that keeps you from the emergency room because these, the, these are emergency crises. But I want to back up to something, you, you know, you were talking about travel bans. I, I think there's, there's almost a, a predisposition to the kind of person who's, who cares about this stuff. <laughs> and I think it relates to travel. I think it relates to what you guys are doing here at FASB. It's about getting young people to go abroad, to live abroad, to, another, to learn another language, to immerse themselves That's in good. another culture. Mm -hmm. I, I was a medical student, and I, and I, and I worked in, uh, in Ecuador for a whole summer in this little hospital hospital called Baco Artis in Quito. And I, you know, we used to choose antibiotics here based on the on the grid about which bugs were resistant to what. Um, in those days, we would kid would come in, have an infection, and they would say, "Which antibiotic do we have downstairs?" Because that's all that we. And they were no, there was no drug resistance because the drugs weren't being overused. I'd never seen such deprivation in a healthcare system in my entire life. And and since that time, I've been you know very involved in, in Latin America. I'm going to Guatemala in a few weeks to talk about research ethics in, in, in uh, Guatemala City. And I think that having early pivotal experiences kind of acculturates you to this world that is bigger than here. Uh, and, and I think we have a kind of you know, very narrow view. And it's not medical education, I think, whether it's a, you're a legal, legal person or, or in the ministry or a journalist, the kind of people who care about this stuff probably, for the most part, had an early experience abroad and a cross-cultural immersion. And I think that should be you know, required, and if we, if we still believe in liberal education, which we should, that should be an element of it because it predisposes people to look at these problems as if they were on, to, to affirm the commonality of what's going on there and here, to understand, uh, you know, the colonial history, President Monroe, Liberia, the freed slaves, all, all of that stuff is part of the narrative that it's not just about hemorrhagic fever. Can I build on something that, that Larry said and both of you are working on? And that is, a, a colleague of mine likes to, likes to uh, say this every once in a while, but no disaster is a natural disaster. Right. That's right. Because a disaster, by definition, is an event that overwhelms the ability of the community to respond. If we had invested more in various places, if the governments had invested more in health care, in this case, there would not, be, not have been a disaster. If there is a storm, that comes and, and uh, destroys thousands of houses and, and kills people. The storm, is, it's not a natural disaster. It would, because we could have educated people, we could have storm shelters that people could flee to, we could be prepared to meet that storm in a way that there is no loss or lower loss. Lower loss is not the same as no loss. I mean, that implies Wow, uh, a, a real belief in uh, human uh, technology and innovation that uh, we could, with the right amount of preparation, uh, surmount any disaster. I mean, if a tsunami like that, which happened in the East, happened on the shores of New York, it would be a disaster, right? I mean, Sandy right. was a bit of a disaster, and you can say, yes, but we're going to deal with that in the next 
100 year storm, we're going to do better. I mean, global warming, which is happening by inches, right, is right. potentially a disaster. Uh, that is the one where I would agree with you that if, if humans were far seeking enough, uh, you know, maybe we could do something about that. But even, uh, I think it's the WHO now is, mm -hmm. is, has changed its language to suggest that the movement now, we have to still do what we can to forestall or even prevent aspects of it, but fundamentally this is about developing policies that will help us cope with the inevitable impact of global warming, and that's what the last big report was about. Everyone agrees with Larry. How could we not agree with Larry? <laughs> but I have to say that, uh, you know, for you to say, you know, we shouldn't be covering this stuff or focusing I on it ep that. episodically, not covering oh. it. No, I'm... Mm. I know you didn't say we shouldn't be covering, but we shouldn't be doing this focus, whether we're media or humanitarian organizations or whomever, governments, Congress, episodically we need to have sustained funding to, you know, to address what is a chronic issue or an issue that will take 30 years to resolve. I mean, all the problems, how to fix Boko Haram is, is a 30-year problem. You have to do that in Nigeria, and you don't have a government that can support uh, that kind of uh, effort, in, and we certainly weren't going to supply it anyway. But uh, I think that that's, I mean, it's absolutely true, but it's kind of like I wish, you know, I feel we'd be much better as a civilization if there were no war. Cause it, because it, it, it isn't taking into account human nature, which is inevitably going to have a profound influence on this stuff. And, and as, a, as a reporter, I think about this quite a lot. I mean, there was a study where, you know, they showed eight kids and said $300,000 will save the lives of these kids and fix all their medical problems. And, uh, and it was shown to a group. And then to an, another group was shown a picture of one kid, $300,000 will solve all his physical problems. And uh, maybe you know these studies, you probably too, do. Uh, many more people were willing to donate to the one kid's cause mm -hmm. than to the eight kid's cause. So it isn't even that, you know, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. It goes well beyond that. Uh, the same guy, Paul Slovak, did another study to see how far does this go. So he had a picture of a girl who, who was very sick, a young girl, and said, $30,000 will fix all her problems. I don't have the exact wording. Mm -hmm. And then her, basically it was her brother, same thing, beautiful child, $30,000 will fix all of his problems. And then a picture of the two of them together, $30,000 will fix all their problems, and showed it to equivalent groups. They were willing to give an equal amounts to the little girl and to the little boy. It went cut in half when it was the two kids. So it just shows that, you know, in a, in a reverse of a basic arithmetic, mm -hmm. one plus one is less than two. That's how we get our minds around things. That's why we cover things episodically. Yeah. Joe I mean, and, and, and Larry, we, both of you, talked about misinformation, exaggerated reporting. You believe, you described your view of public health and the importance of, of the correct information flow. What do you do differently? What should be, what, what's the responsibility of the public health, what's the responsibility of the, of the medical profession? Well, um, it's actually a very good question because it, I think that was a beautiful example. Uh, and I, I use, I, I've used that example, but not as eloquently as you just did. <laughs> But, the, but people often ask me, why do we spend so much on individual health care and not on population-based public health and prevention? And I usually try to explain it by uh, the rescue imperative. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're willing to pay whatever it takes to, to get the little girl out of the well or to give her double heart transplants. But if you want to save, with vaccination, 100 statistical lives of inner city kids, people are just not willing to do it. And it, that it's, it, it's very prominent in the United States, but that feeling is ubiquitous mm -hmm. in my 
in my experience across the world. And I spend my, that's my, that's what I live for to try to, to, to counteract because I do, when you asked about resources, I mean, I think that there are very clear cost effective things that we could do that of course, we, you're perfectly right, we would, we'll never you know, solve all the problems, we'll, we'll never uh, uh, end humanitarian disasters or even the endemic problems, but there's so, the, the solutions to me are very, very clear. How to prevent the next Ebola to me is very, very clear. The three things I would do, I'll just list them very quickly. One, I would have a global health reserve workforce so that you could rapidly deploy them um, to an area. Two, I would have an, an international emergency contingency fund when the WHO declares a public health emergency of international concern. It mobilizes it. There was an independent WHO commission that recommended it. WHO never did it. And then the third is something I proposed in the Lancet, which is basically an international health systems fund. It's a longer term health systems capacity building um, fund. Those things, it seems to me, are very clear. I don't know anybody who really thinks about these problems who disagree with it, but we don't do it. And I don't know why. It has Bill and Melinda Gates written all over it. <laughs> no, because it, it actually doesn't, because you know, Bill and Melinda Gates are, are, you know, they're wonderful. What they do is special, but they are very technologically driven. And they and have an award and, for you back when yeah, you were on stage. They're <laughs> very, very technologically driven. And in fact, they've been, we're, we're coming up, the, the UN in, in New York in September is going to be adopting the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals. And one of the things that WHO and others have, have, have really urged was universal health coverage as basically, Bill and Gates have been very opposed to that. Um, so you would think it does have yeah. them written over it, but if you know their, think, their, their signature, it's not. I mean, it's not that they don't do wonderful things and they're not wonderful people, but I don't think they like to solve individual problems. Yeah, they, and isn't that the whole thing? Because yeah. you want to do something that's doable. I really and that's think, what, think $30,000 will fix that kid. Yes. You're maybe perfect. not two kids. And that's their view. Yeah. And it's not, a, it's not a horrible view. It's, I don't agree with it, but it's not, a, it's not an indefensible view. Joe, one of the things that, that I found interesting in the Ebola context is the speed with which vaccines are being approved, um, which is not the norm in the United States or elsewhere. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how public policy maybe should influence the behavior of the FDA? Interesting question. I mean, one, one of the, the challenges going back to the, our own swine flu epidemic, you know, is the liability of, of, of drug companies for vaccines that, that go bad, even though statistically, when they look back at, at Guillaume Barre, there was no statistical relationship, <laughs> yeah. and it was just a ran, random events in proximity to, to the, to the uh, vaccination. So there have been, there's I don't been think some. I understand what you're that, referring that, to. Just, that yeah. the swine flu epidemic, I think, in 1976, there yeah. were, people got Guillain Brain ascending like poliomyelitis. Uh -huh. And and it Big was scandal. thought to be related to the vaccine, which caused wasn't. an immune response. Yeah. But it just turned out, if you look at the statistics, uh, an epidemiology of it, yeah. the number of cases that happened before vaccination and after vaccination yeah. were the same, so it was not related in any way. Same as but, autism. Yeah, you know, well, this with, autism with the, claim. The, the right. Marisol, with the Got Marisol, it. Right? Yeah. Thanks. So, so, so that's, that gets back to the science literacy mm -hmm. question about, you know, looking at data and knowing what it means and not drawing false conclusions from it. But there have been a number of, um, of, of bills that were passed to actually immunize uh, um, pharmaceutical houses from any liability that, are, that correlate with, with, uh, with, the, with toxicity from vaccines because they, they didn't want to get involved um, and, and because the market was, it was, there was, it was dangerous. So I think we have to you know, create a public-private partnership so that the infrastructure that is available can actually make, make vaccines. Then it raises the question of the rights of human subjects overseas and not testing vaccines over there. I mean, I'm going to Guatemala in part because we tried to test penicillin as a prophylaxis against gonorrhea and syphilis back in the late 40s, and the, and the President's Commission on Bioethics just wrote a, a report about two or three years ago. Uh, this is a sidebar to the Tuskegee syphilis study, mm, yeah. where they went down and they, they, they had this reasonable idea, you know, penicillin can treat gonorrhea and syphilis, 
might not we be able to prevent it by giving it to people prospectively? And a New York Times reporter, thinking about this in 1947, argued that that would be ethically impossible because you'd have to get people the disease. And it turned out they went down to Guatemala because it was off the radar. And this is all written up in the, in the uh, President's Commission report. And they actually injected uh, gonorrhea and syphilis into, these, into patients. They injected cisternal injections for neurosyphilis um, because the incidence of new cases of gonorrhea and syphilis was so, so low that, that they couldn't test their hypothesis. So they gave people the disease. Uh, and and uh, Secretary Clinton and Secretary Sebelius apologized to their counterparts in Guatemala about four years ago. So, you know, uh, so, so we, we really have to be very aware of, uh, of, of the risk of a kind of, you know, research ethic imperialism and, and, and not to abuse the rights of human subjects. On the other hand, if you've got a credible hypothesis and you've got safety data and all, and you have an epidemic, and you have you have uh, you've crossed a threshold that you cross here, because I think there should be a similar standard for human subject protections here and abroad. Then I think it's okay to test to test vaccines in the face of an epidemic if there is a therapeutic intent and a greater likelihood of it being therapeutic than harmful. You know, in research, we always exist in a state of what we call equipoise, a state of relative ignorance, um, and and no research is safe. You know, just categorically, if it wasn't. If it was safe and effective, it would be called therapy. Even and sometimes therapy is not safe. Um, but I don't think we should have a double standard, and we should be attentive to that history, which is really sobering. So let me interpret that beautiful statement for the lay audience. Right. Um, so for Ebola, basically what that would would mean is is that if you have a vaccine that we test primarily in the United States for safety and basic effectiveness, uh, it then is probably you, you will need to test it in West Africa because you don't have indigenous, ca disease, right. indigenous right. cases here, and so you actually have, have to do that. Um, the only thing I would, and I, mean, I think you would agree with me, but it's not, you wouldn't always have the same standard of human subject protection here as there, and, and the 076 trial would be the best example of that. This is basically the uh, 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 was a very controversial issue about whether or not we could give low dose antiretroviral medication in Africa, right. and I think most ethicists thought that, that it was all right that you didn't have to give the same standard of care as you'd give in the United States. But it was. I'm, I'm more thinking about that. That's an yeah. efficacy question versus a toxicity. Exactly. Question. Of course, right. you're exactly right. right. I was right. just interpreting. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I want to, I'd like to raise sort of a question, and that is that going back to the movies that we were introduced to earlier, are we trying to solve problems in partnership with folks in the field, or are we trying to do it based on a fear that we have, that we harbor? And it's not a question for you guys necessarily, but what what are we feeling on this, and what and what what pressure are, are, are we experiencing on this? Because I, one of the practices that that we try to engage in is to connect with partners on the ground and ask them how they would like to respond to the disaster and support them in that work, rather than coming in and jumping out of airplanes and saying, all right, here's what we're going to do and do And that's, that's a deployment model. That's a model that, that, that invades a country and basically says, we're here to save you and fix this problem for you, instead of consulting with folks and saying, how can we support you in your efforts? I mean, just, just you know, in the literature, in the, in the uh, health justice literature, the argument has evolved from a kind of human rights approach to what's called a capabilities approach, like uh, SEN and, and Vedicaporin, you know, that, that it's really, you know, give people a, a fishing rod to learn how to fish, instead of just saying, here, this is how you prepare the fish. Um, and really, it's, it, it, it's cross-cultural, it's translational. When we teach bioethics, and we've done that around the world, and, and uh, you just can't explain, you know, what we do here, there. You have to work with partners, you have to find out what their cultural context is we have a medical school branch of the medical school in Doha in Qatar and uh, and and we teach informed consent there um, if you disclose the level you disclose here to patients there they think you're withholding something 
it's a kind of a paradoxical response because of the, the, you know, the context is a high and low context societies. It's different than, than our, our society. In both places, you have respect for human persons. But the way it gets operationalized can be quite different. And it can be offensive to a different culture if you come in and do the deployment you know, invasion approach. And so I think it's as much a scientific question as a sociological question. And, and so, Larry, you, you gave your three-part solution to the world's problems. It's not a total solution, but it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good start. Ninety <laughs> percent. Enough um, for an Oscar. Yes. <laughs> Maybe a Tony. A Tony. <laughs> is what um, Jack and Joe, is what they've been talking about in the past few minutes, respecting the local culture, um, respecting the local needs, are they consistent with your three-part solution? They actually are. Um, the, the, again, I'm going to interpret these right. two beautiful um, <laughs> statements. But I, when I first got into the field of global health, I, I, it's only about five, seven years ago. I was in public health before that. And I had this idea. And I now realize that this, I was completely wrong. And I thought, that, I said, this is the problem. There is only one problem, that basically poor countries can't afford to, to protect the health of their citizens, and rich countries don't have the political will to help. And I realized that was complete white guilt nonsense, because the primary responsibility is on the country. And and, it, and you can't just let them off the hook. Um, uh, the Abuja Declaration, uh, where all every African head of state promised to give a certain percentage of their budget to health, none of them have, have actually um, adopted that. And so I think we do have to hold them accountable. And not only hold them accountable, but, but it's their, their decision. We can't just jump in and, and do what we want. So I, I talk about um, mutual responsibilities. Mm -hmm. There is a responsibility of each country to provide within their capacities for the health of their population. There's certain very, very clear evidence-based ways to do that. Um, and then there will be a capacity gap. And that's where the international community needs to help build that gap. And I think there's been deficiency on both ends of that mutual responsibility. I don't Sorry, I, I'm, I don't want to let you off the hook. I'm not with you yet. Because you talked about the responsibility for global action. Mm -hmm. um, but then you talk about capacity gap, which I understand. Maybe it's partially resource gap, too. But what if there's not the will? Um, what if there's not the local will? Well, that. And there's corruption, um, there's bad governance, uh, there, there's a whole, you know, the, the problem, you know, sometimes I get up in the morning and I'm so exhilarated and I think, you know, we can solve this. And then the next I get up and I'm just so despondent, I think it's just hopeless, it's just can't, we just can't, we can't do it. And yes, there is a huge um, uh, problem of political will and how you change uh, politics, how you have good governance for health. Um, uh, and uh, it, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. I, I have, I've got an, a, a proposal for a framework convention on global health to try to change the global norms around, around those things and to try to in, instill some kind of um, uh, uh, international norm around health development. Um, but is it easy? Will we ever get to it? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, there are certain things that no one knows the answer to. We know what the problem is. It's just finding the answer is very, very hard in some of these countries. Some, some of it is because they're genuinely poor, but very often they don't begin to do what they should. So, I mean, when, I was, when I'm in Beijing or, or, uh, or Dhaka, where I, I just was, and you know, and I would try to, ex the, these are the things you need to do. So that's what I would say, and I, I, could, I could explain what those are. But basically they said, you know, we can't do that. That's just, you know, it's impossible. We, it's just, you know, it's just too overwhelming. And if you see how big the population is and how poor it is, it, it does seem overwhelming. Then you just ask the question, do you think your government is doing all that it could within its capabilities 
to improve the health of the population, and there is not one hand that goes up anywhere. Well, I think notwithstanding the critique of the episodic response, which I, I agree with, um, it, it, these, are, these episodes are, should become teaching moments. And, yes. and that's where statesmanship <clears throat> comes in. And, and we wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't for this, you know, this crisis, and probably because it, when the crisis came to New York, uh, it wouldn't have gotten on our radar screen. So I think you know, we want to turn these, these crises into opportunities. And I would just add, because I, I, you know, we're talking about health, but it's really a broader question of infrastructure, because you can't sustain a healthcare system if you don't have an infrastructure. No. So I would say right. you know, there should be equal priority for education, in-country education, to build up the, the human capital that's necessary to, to sustain and implement uh, the efforts that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, if people uh, often will ask me, well, if there was one thing you could do for the health of the population, educate. it was ver educate women. Yeah. Basically, that would, that would be right. it. You, an educated woman has, an, has a healthy family, has a healthy community. And so it's not just the health sector. You're absolutely right. It's, it's much broader than that. Brooke, we, we, FASB does not have a program for politicians, for professional, well, I don't know what school they go to. Um, uh, so it seems to me that, that the, it's a fair question to ask you, the media, how it is that you translate what you've heard here in a way that creates a public interest, a public I don't want to say a call to action, but, but a public interest. How, how, how we do or how, how we should? <laughs> how you should, how you can. How we can. Okay, well, speaking as the media, <laughs> a uh, multifarious and a unitary institution in which every part is exactly like the other and functions in precisely the same way according to the same business model, I would say that hey, if I'm speaking for the church, you can speak for the church. <laughs> fair enough, yeah. fair enough. Um, you know, uh, there are, it's, very, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, I work in broadcast media, but I cover media. So I know that mm. social media and digital media, media work in incredibly different ways. And, uh, you know, if the question is, what is the story we should be telling, then I would say that depending on the medium that you're engaged in, it's still a different story. Uh, if you are engaged uh, on the local level and on the micro level, then you, you know, you use social media to, to gather in the immediate community. And there are all sorts of digital tools that began to be developed out of the crisis in Haiti so that people actually know where the health facilities are. I mean, it's a, it's a basic sort of nuts and bolts, go here for food, go there for a bed, go here for medicines, take your sick people here to, for emergency care in, in an emergency. And obviously, if that situation becomes institutionalized and those facilities remain available, then social media can be used the same way. You go to a, a website to do that, or uh, interest groups can propagate that information. And then you have things like bring back our girls. And you know, a lot of people say that was a total waste of time because the girls never got back. But if you talk to reporters there, as I have, they say, uh, you know, it worked for a while. The Nigerian government has been completely unresponsive to anything that was one brief moment when they changed their tactics and some small amount of good was done. Did it have the goal that people wanted it to have? Obviously, absolutely not. Is that a reason to discredit hashtag campaigns entirely? No. They raise awareness. What happens after that isn't the media's problem, right? It's, a, it's every individual's problem. Uh, with regard to the kinds of stories I would tell. And the reason why I, I went to Liberia after the crisis had peaked but was still present was to shadow a news organization there. Liberia is arguably Liberia's best 
newspaper called Front Page Africa, as they went about the business of reporting on their own country. So I got to report through the lens of their priorities, their living conditions, their challenges. It was a deep dive into the politics, the very complicated politics of Liberia. And, uh, and then you heard them laughing. You heard them living meaningful lives. You hopefully at the end of it, because they were, I was very lucky, I found people who were incredibly likable as well as profoundly professional. Hopefully you might have a stake, a little bit of a stake in how, uh, on how they make out at the end of this. Um, you know, then we get back to your initial question that I've always reject, you know, resisted. Do the media set an agenda? Well, if the agenda is, and let's face it, most reporters are, are not computers, and, and in fact, they don't even pretend to belong to this you know, order of entirely objective, passionless priests, which were, sorry, which were the, uh, which, which was the kind of style President of mid-century journalism. We, we now know that you can, we're going back to sort of the early part of the century where opinion can infuse journalism, that's a whole other discussion, and still be very reliable, trustworthy journalism. Because we live in an age of links, so we can check that. So everybody has their own agenda in the media. I'll sum up and say, I know, I can tell the music is playing. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, the idea is to figure out the story that you want to tell, make it true, make it compelling, make it fair, and then tell it. And you do that very well. Oh, but thank you. You mean me personally or you me per the media? Not the media, no. <laughs> you, NPR, I mean, there, there are some really, there's some, you know, there isn't a media. I mean, th there is, there's a, a far cry from NPR, TBS, uh, BBC, and some other un unnamed. <laughs> Let me open up questions to the audience. We have microphones. Do we have questions? <laughs> One thing I was struck by was the uh, repeated discussion of the short attention span that we as society or the media have on issues. And I find that reflected in myself with what I'm interested in and what I feel passionate about. There's a lot of things that, I mean, 10 years ago I would say one thing, this is what I'm going to do with my life, and then five years ago I'd say this is what I'm going to do with my life, and then two weeks ago I said this is a really important issue, I want to spend time on it. So, like, how, how would you say this is what we're going to do, or as a society, or as a media, how would you resolve that within yourself? Because then we'd have to have someone dealing with this issue ongoing, and then someone else dealing with that issue ongoing, and I think that'd be relatively tricky. Well, I'll just say very quickly that there are a bunch of biases built into the media that have nothing to do with politics, but have to do with the American business model and it, with the way that we crunch information individually as, as human beings, how we're wired. And, uh, you know, one of them is, you know, newness bias. Things have to be new. In fact, the reason why we don't go back to stories that used to dominate the front page is because they're not that new anymore. There's a bad news bias. We feel a much greater identification or interest in things that potentially threaten us. There's visual bias. You need pictures. There weren't any coming out of uh, the areas of Nigeria where Boko Haram marauded for two weeks. Uh, there weren't uh, the, what happened at Abu Ghraib was being reported on a year and a half, two years before those pictures came out. The same stories, nobody cared. Uh, so, and, and, a, and a bunch of other things like this. So, you know, how do we solve that problem? I think it's every individual needs, you know, if they, I don't know how to tell people how to lead ethical lives. I mean, the, the perfect human being would choose something valuable that they'll devote their time to in a sustained way if they have the ability to do that, if they're lucky enough to have a job that enables them to do that. Or, and then the rest of the time, they just keep looking at the world and, and you know, do things by and by and bit by bit. I don't think you can reconcile the two, and I know that you can't cure it, because we're just not wired that way. All right. Um, one ethical implication of Ebola is um, sending individuals into harm's way. And I wonder if each of you could talk about 
um, what it means to send reporters, especially with fast speed, we're talking about young people um, uh, and their professional decisions. Well, a journalist has to make decisions. Do I put myself in harm's way by going to, uh, to Africa? Or do I, as a, as a doctor, do I put myself in harm's way as a, as a church relief worker? Um, I, I think that's one element that I would like to hear um, you discuss um, and maybe some of the experiences you've had um, going to those places. I know, Brooke, you were there um, uh, in Liberia. Uh, uh, ideas about, you know, am I going to get sick? Am I going to be quarantined? How did each of you just you know, deal with that and your travels? Joe, you were talking about heroism before. Why don't you, you start? Right. So, you know, th this is the, the precise question that, prompt, that prompted my, uh, my original uh, piece uh, about whether physicians should do uh, CPR on patients who had end-stage uh, Ebola and, and hemodynamic uh, failure. Um, you know, one of the challenges is when you're at the end of your disease, your viral load is the highest and your risk of being contagious is the highest. Um, and, and for somebody to go into the room, uh, if there's a cardiac arrest, it takes 10 minutes to put on their personal protective gear. At which time, uh, you know, they're ten uh, minutes dead. Ten minutes. Well, brain death happens in eight minutes, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, so people would you know might be heroic and rush in as we always do for every other cardiac arrest. As fast as you can get there, you get there, and so I, I went through the analysis and I and I and I engaged in what we call analogic reasoning and thinking like, well, when I was a resident during the AIDS epidemic, you know, I resuscitated or tried to resuscitate a lot of patients. Uh, and I was, I guess, at some risk, but I thought it was an acceptable risk. I also thought that the that there was therapy on the other side. Most people who had AIDS in those days and and before heart, I was a resident before the the antiretroviral drugs were were available and and very effective, turning it and got into a kind of a chronic disease. Most of these patients had pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, and that caused respiratory failure, and that caused a cardiac arrest. So if you could get them on a ventilator and you could ventilate them for a while, and you give them pentamidine or Bactrim or the drugs that were available in those days, you might be able to stem the tide and bring them back. And some of those people were saved and now are on heart and still probably alive. So, so the, the point was that the, the, the risk-benefit calculation was, was what, what I thought of. And, and I thought that, uh, that we, 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 uh, we, had, we, we, we should always talk to families and patients about what we're going to offer them. And we should never unilaterally dictate treatment decisions unless the treatment decision, that treatment is futile or disproportionately harmful. You're not obliged to do that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, reasonable families and, and people will probably make the choice that's consistent with proportionality. And in fact, Mr. Duncan's family had decided to make him DNR. And after I wrote the piece that I wrote, it turned out the University of Nebraska, which is the leading place in the country that treats the patients that come back, has a policy of not doing CPR. So to answer your question in a somewhat roundabout way, um, I, I think it's really that, that all the professions engender self-sacrifice and some degree of risk, and you just have to look at the specifics of the situation in an inductive way, not deductive way, to look at the particularities. There's certain war zones you will not go into. Um, there's certain clinical contexts that, that I wouldn't go into, but I would go into others. Being a professional means you do engage in some degree of self-sacrifice. So it's just a, it's it's just finding that right titration. And some people were going to be on either side of that confidence interval. And and the people on this side of the confidence interval we call hero, heroes. And and uh, and we should admire heroes. But again, we uh, we shouldn't turn uh, that into an obligation because when you look at some of the manpower issues, there were concerns in Toronto about fam. Healthcare workers had concerns about showing up for work, that's right. and and that's a you know that's the under underbelly of heroism. Uh, so we shouldn't have placed expectations on mothers and fathers of young kids to to uh, have them perceive at least undue risk. Again, we don't want to engage in hyperbole, and it's got to be evidence based. <clears throat> um, so it's a very fine line, and sometimes by even bringing this stuff up, you've crossed the line uh, because it's kind of like going behind. Uh, uh, Goffman's, uh, you know, curtain, uh, but 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 sometimes you have to pull the shades back and say, look, guys, this is what it is. Because I, one thing I really do believe in is that we have to have make informed decisions, and information is what empowers decisions. That's why 
I, I won't ever criticize a journalist because I think that that with, uh, it's really without a without journalism, uh, do we don't have democracy, living, so. and 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 they're the fundamentally most important thing. And then with the other half of that is you know critical thinking because we got to know when it's true when it's not true. Um, but without information, we can't make these important uh, choices, these value choices. You know, I agree with everything you said. I would just give one postscript: is that we we tend without to translation. Without a translation, just, right, a post, just a postscript, <laughs> um, because it was translated beautifully. Thank you. Um, the, the, um, the way we, in the United States particularly, but also in other high-income countries, the way we frame these problems is uh, American workers and whether they're heroic how, and so forth. But we have to remember that the risks here, if done well, are not just lower, they're, they're of magnitudes much lower. Though in Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, and uh, Liberia, they've lost nearly half their health workers to Ebola. I mean, it's, a, it's an, of an order of a magnitude different. And we have to really bear in mind that reality and how we can actually protect frontline workers there um, from, uh, from those kinds of things. because. The truth is, is that for the most part in the United States, um, we made some slip-ups initially for some, for some reasons. But for the most part, high-income countries can protect its health workers. That's not the case uh, in poorer countries. And we have to think much more carefully about how of training of uh, personal protective equipment and other things and how we can try to shore up the safety there. I would just add that uh, my calculus is similar, but maybe a little different, and that is that since we work with partners, we don't deploy people at every event. But there are times when we need somebody to, to go out and interface with, with folks on the ground. And I always ask this question, is it, why am I going? Am I going just to take pictures, to, to do publicity, that sort of thing? Because if that's the sole reason for going, then I shouldn't go. But if we're going to actually build some capacity and to try to answer some questions that we can't get answered from a distance, then that makes a little more sense. But we all, we all have jug, you know, we all have fears and things that we, we scramble with when we engage in this work, certainly. I'll just say very quickly that I, uh, I never felt in danger, ever. Uh, I never, uh, it's not that I haven't done occasionally some dangerous work. I, I think the, the level of risk was never enormously high. I've been in some uh, urban fire zones and things, but you know, you can duck around a building. <laughs> and, uh, and in terms of uh, Ebola, I knew that I wasn't going to be directly handling anybody who was showing symptoms of Ebola. I did talk to a doctor who treated Ebola, but he didn't have any symptoms. Uh, I've I talked to members of a uh, quarantine family. They did not have any symptoms. I was very well aware of how it's transmitted and how it isn't. And even with those people, those were the only people who were even in a position to have picked it up, I, I brought a boom, gave me an extra four feet, which was, was enough. And, uh, and I was with a bunch of people. I was with reporters who knew what they were doing, who were, who were careful themselves, even though they were right in it at the very beginning. So I never really felt any risk. I, I can't say the same for WNYC, where there was uh, uh, much hubbub for a while. I was actually much more concerned with the issue of, uh, I got a lot of the question much more than with any foreign trip, why are you going? You know, and, I, and the implication was, is this kind of grandstanding? And uh, if I thought it was, I absolutely would not have done it. I didn't need to plant my flag there. I just felt, as, a, as an analyst and a critic of the media, that Ebola had, uh, had reduced Liberia to even less than it was before the disease arose there. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, my curiosity was aroused. But I, I but if, insofar as I was reporting on the disease, it was a meta report. I was reporting on the process of these reporters going about their business. And that was something that I had not heard or seen and that I wanted to contribute. Hi. I would 
would uh, like to hear opinions from each of your vantage points on anxiety reduction. Uh, and let me explain what I mean. Um, anxiety is something that motivates people to do something much more than anything else. I think it swamps empathy. Um, and um, it also is responsible for a lot of these hasty and prominent and long policy suggestions that happen when there's something coming up. And in a way, Ebola is sort of a perfect storm. And it's new, it's fatal, and we don't know much about it. And it's sort of more like the beginning of AIDS or terrorism in Europe than it is like a typhoon or an earthquake or even Boko Haram, which people don't perceive as a, a direct threat. And it seems like if we want public policy to be reasonable, it's important to figure out how, from each of these perspectives, we can reduce anxiety um, while we still don't know everything. I, I want to just say that all those things that you said it was and it wasn't, I, I would go completely the reverse. And I would say that it's because of the way the media present it uh, as those things, you know, as more like AIDS, but it's actually nothing like AIDS, which, it, which needs to be, you know, contained in a particular way. The problem why it went out of control was because in outbreaks in the past, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, it, it, it had been contained That's relatively right. easily. Yeah. So yes. as a result... No, I'm talking about the anxiety levels. Right, like, but I'm just saying that, reality. but it has to do with, I, that I understand, but, and I should have said that. It's just interesting because the anxiety is generated, is occasioned by the way it's depicted. And, uh, and what you, you were absolutely citing, you know, it's, it's terrorism and it's, it's uh, because that's how it was depicted. The same thing with, uh, you know, AIDS. But it's not like that. It, it got out of control because actually of, a, of too much complacency, really, on the part of the organizations that we're familiar with containing it. And so it just went uh, But it is, you know, it's, it's actually not like that at all. I mean, AIDS was, was uh, defiantly in opposition to that outbreak narrative that I talked about at the beginning, because it was mysterious and it couldn't be contained and it couldn't be cured and, and on and on. Whereas Ebola gets cured again and again and again. I mean, not cured. It gets defeated again and again uh, by our own Public health measures. Yeah. Uh, so it's so then so getting to your question, which is about how do you reduce anxiety uh, that occasions interest, but also bad public policy, is I think that's the central dilemma. And in conclusion, I will say, I don't have a clue. <laughs> well, I mean the. Um, we do know a lot about Ebola. We've had 25 outbreaks since uh, 1976. Um, and we've brought them all under control. It's a very preventable disease. And, and the way, the reason I've thought that, that this, the West African uh, epidemic was so unconscionable is, is that it is a highly prevent, preventable disease. But I think you, you do, I think you have a very um, insightful point about anxiety and sympathy um, because there there and anxiety in the united states overwhelmed our sympathy for the country we were willing to do things that would harm those that were really suffering because we were so wrongly anxious now how you can um, part of that anxiety was just oh it's a very scary disease i mean we, we there's a lot of research as to why uh, people um, uh, people see risks much greater than they actually are. One is salience. When the media keeps reporting it, it does, it, it does that. The other is un, an unusual event. Hemorrhagic fever is very unusual. Another is a very horrific event, like a plane crash, where you, nobody wants to die, but nobody wants to die of a hemorrhagic fever. So I think the only antidote, I mean, I, I did notice, now whether I, it's right or not, I mean, you'd be more of an expert than I, but I, was, I, I lived in Europe for a little bit of time during Ebola, um, and the, the BBC in particular was very calming. There wasn't the same hysteria in the country, even though there were cases uh, in Europe and, and then in the, uh, in the United Kingdom. 
But every time the media would get on, they would say, no, this is not that kind of a disease. This is what it does. And I just thought, wow, that's very accurate. It's very thoughtful. And you didn't see it as much in the United States. I mean, there were, of course, there were pockets of wonderful journalism. The New York Times has done a great job. But nonetheless, the whole gestalt of it was very damaging and very anxiety producing. And so one of the things I was trying to do and many others were just saying, OK, hold on. Don't get so nervous. This is not a threat to us. It's a threat there. And so sympathy should be much more important than anxiety. But it was very difficult. Our response in these countries uh, totaled about uh, just over a half a million dollars. And through, through a, a number of grants with, with a variety of partner organizations. And much of that work was education. And it was local, grassroots type of education to help people understand that Ebola is real and these are the things that you should or shouldn't do, and, and dispelling a lot of the myths. So the strategy was to try to reduce anxiety in part. In the US, on the other hand, this, we had a different phenomenon. You know, most of what we try to do in, in this work that I'm involved in is metaphorically help people who are burned by fires. Okay, they leave and there's a, di a disaster or something and they, they flee from something and their, their lives are burned by this. And we try to help them, work with them. But in this case, we were being pressured. There was, why, why isn't UMCOR fixing this problem? Why aren't we solving the problem? Why aren't we putting out the fire, if you were? Well, so there was a different mindset uh, pushing us in, in, this, in this regard. I also want to say that it is, um, there is a, um, there was a, a lot of these talk um, conferences, uh, teleconferences, and people were, were, various people were encouraging me to participate in these. In the fall, there were tons of them, and you, you all participated in them, I'm sure. I got on one of these that was supposed to be addressing issues related to religious movements helping with humanitarian assistance. And one of the big speakers on the, the, the big segment of, the, of this talk was about how churches can pre prevent Ebola from coming to their congregation or what, they, what measures they should take here in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And so they talked about communion. Should we do communion? Should we give up that practice? And, and um, there was a lot of, a lot of I would just say nonsense out there about how this disease would affect people in their religious practices. A flu is much more contagious. If you can practice communion and, and safeguard against flu, you can probably safeguard against some of the measures of Ebola. 20,000 20, 20, <laughs> flu deaths in the United States right. annually compared to how many Ebola? It's famously been said that uh, <laughs> Twice as many people have been married to Larry King in America than have gotten uh, Ebola. You know, Jack used, the, <clears throat> Jack used the fire metaphor. And I couldn't help but think that the phenomenon you, you're asking us about is an American phenomenon. And it was isolationism. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt talked about lend lease and helping our, our European you know, allies in World War II when we were, we were shielded by the oceans. It was lending a fire hose to put out that fire. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is a deeply nice. you know it's not just related to disease and Ebola it relates to our little sense of of uh, being isolated from the rest of the world but but uh, of course that's just not the way it really is especially with epidemic disease with, with <laughs> pandemic disease yeah. right Larry I have some bad news there was a poll taken and there were four Oscars given <laughs> <laughs> as well they should have been uh, thank you all. Uh, for doing this very informative, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.